Hello everyone. Welcome to yet another session of our NPTEL on nonlinear and adaptive control. I am Shrikant Sukumar from Systems and Control, IIT Bombay. We are again in front of this uh, nice new motivating image for our course, and uh, this uh, very nice SpaceX satellite, which is uh, hovering around the Earth, and the algorithms that we are designing and analyzing are going to be applicable for autonomous flight of systems such as these. So we are in week number five and what we were doing was talking about a new notion of persistency of excitation, right? which is somehow saying that even if the vector signal is uh, you know, even if the you know, outer product of a vector signal is, you know, is, is not full rank, yeah, we can uh, integrate it over a certain window of time to get full rank, in fact, get definiteness, all right. So, and this is something that is rather useful in system identification, which precedes adaptive control, yeah. So one of the things that I would like to sort of point out is that it is also possible to uh, define this similarly for uh, matrix signals also. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Even if it's a matrix signal, we can have an identical definition and nothing really changes. All right. So great. We also saw some examples last time. Right. So what we want to do today is to sort of connect persistence of excitation to stability all right so this is where we begin so this is lecture 5.3 all right so this is lecture 5.3 right so all right let me fix this a little bit yeah all right so let's look at a very simple uh, scalar problem all right, let's look at a rather simple scalar problem, which is that of a system which looks like this, where it's just a scalar system. But what we are told is that A and A dot uh, are, are bounded. We are also, uh, of course, told that, I mean, irrespective of what is uh, A of T, it should be evident to you that a square t is greater than or equal to zero. In fact, uh, yeah, irrespective of what a of t is, a square t is greater than or equal to zero. Now, notice that I only said it is greater than or equal to zero. I did not say anything about it being strictly positive. If it was strictly positive, then claiming stability of this is not difficult right if a squared of t was in fact strictly positive then claiming stability is rather easy yeah rather easy because i can simply bound it and then compute the integral and so on and then i'll get a standard exponential stability result but that is not what we are saying yeah we will say a square is positive and we are of course also going to say a of t is persistently exciting yeah pe the standard acronym for persistently exciting okay so we are saying that a is not necessarily non zero at all instants of time but a is persistently exciting all right so over a moving in window average something nice is happening right great now if you want to evaluate the stability of the system, what will I do? I will just integrate it. It's a scalar system, not difficult to integrate at all. All right, so this is what we will do. We will simply integrate the scalar system. All right, and what will I get? I will get just by taking x to this side and then integrating this over time and this over x, I will get something like xt is x0 exponential of 
minus t0 to t eta of square theta all right so this is what i'm going to get right uh, very standard integration nothing too difficult or too unusual so uh, of course what do we need for exponential stability sort of a result i need that you know norm of xt i mean in this case absolute value of xt has to be gamma x0 e to the power minus alpha t minus t0 for some gamma alpha positive and all time greater than or equal to t0 all right so this is the uh, exponential stability definition applied to system 3.1 okay now we what we do is we break this integral into these windows of time capital t because we know that a is persistent over these windows of time capital t so we will try to break this time window t0 to t in these windows of time capital t but you can imagine i can take only so many windows and then i will be left with some delta which is less than t right so it should be clear that some delta yeah i will i can break the overall time from t0 to t into windows of capital t k windows of capital t and then i'll be left with some you know small reminder remainder and that is basically this delta yeah so so this i try to evaluate this integral and that integral is in fact greater than equal to this integral why is that what i have done is i have ignored this last piece yeah, I've ignored this last piece. But what do I know? The integrand a squared is non-negative. Right? Therefore, if I ignore a piece in this summation, then I'm possibly only uh, reducing the value. Right? Not increasing. Possibly only reducing. Therefore, this is greater than or equal to this guy. Right? This is in fact uh, greater than or equal to this guy. Right? So, uh, Let's look at this, right? Let's look at how uh, this will work out, right? So um, you have like this kind of an unique quality in equation 3.4, right? And then uh, if we assume persistence of excitation as per our definition, then what would we have? We would have that integral of t to t plus cap t is of a squared tau is strictly greater than or equal to mu. And this has to hold true for all t greater than or equal to t0. Okay. Okay. All right. And we are going to use it here. You can imagine I'm going to use it here because each of these are windows of time capital T. Yeah. And this is where all these uniform bounds help us. Yeah. This is not depending on the small t. Otherwise, we would have some trouble. Right. And so, if I just substitute... The left hand side is just the integral from t0 to t but it is greater than or equal to k times mu right because this is just k times this and i know that each of these is greater than or equal to mu and therefore if i just take over summation over k it is greater than or equal to k times mu and that's what i get here and this k times mu right i'm just writing k using the definition that is of t that is i split t into t0 plus kt plus delta and that's what i'm using to get substitute for k from here all right great and why did i substitute so that i get something like a t minus t naught right so what do i have here if i substitute this in equation 3.2 which is what which is this guy then here I have a negative sign, right? So the signs flip, right? The signs flip. So um, this was greater than or equal to, but the exponential of negative, it will become a less than or equal to, right? So from here I will have minus t zero t a square tau d tau is less than or equal to minus t minus t zero minus delta by t mu and e to the power of that will be less than e to the power of that because it is a increasing function all right great okay so <coughs> what did i obtain all right so what did i obtain so 
what I have obtained is um, this kind of an expression right here right because what do I do I take this delta and mu and tp separately outside and then t minus t0 piece inside this so this starts to look like a gamma this starts to look like a uh, alpha and I have the very very established exponential stability definition coming out here okay so pretty straightforward right I have the standard exponential stability definition coming out here all right great great with this gamma and with this alpha right so therefore what have I proved I proved that if I started with a scalar system which looked like this right? and here the A is not necessarily uh, positive strictly positive right so I could in fact have uh, something like say A of T is say sin T yeah which is you know going through zeros also not always positive and therefore I cannot use my conventional integration to conclude exponential stability but what I'm saying is that this particular case uh, if A is not necessarily strictly positive but in fact uh, it's persistently exciting which is what this signal is it is persistently exciting for some window capital T then this system can be shown to be globally exponentially stable right so this is just the scalar case of course I mean just showed it for a scalar example right so we, we sort of connected persistence excited persistence of excitation to stability for a scalar example right obviously if you uh, we want to extend this to a vector case right so the, that's the more general case of course and for that we need few additional results on exponential stability okay and so that is what we are going to look at now right we want to state a few more results on exponential stability okay so this is rather interesting though all right so using this new uh, definition of persistence of excitation we are already able to conclude stability all right and so we want to see uh, uh, you know how we can do the same for vectors you know that is standard state space dynamical systems right so so like we said in order to uh, proceed in this direction we need uh, alternate versions of stability theorems right so this is the alternate exponential stability theorem Okay. so what is this alternate exponential stability theorem we've already seen a standard Lyapunov theorem for exponential stability uh, in fact I'm not going to write it again but I'm going to just go back to where it is All right. Uh, right I mean this is the local version this is the local version no problem the global version is just with the radial unboundedness so if you have a Lyapunov function which is decrescent and then you have the same order class k functions uh, phi 1 phi 2 phi 3 says that v is lower and upper bounded by this phi 1 and phi 2 and v dot is lower bounded by a uh, is upper bounded by a minus phi 3 then you have local exponential stability so notice notice that you require v this is v being positive definite this is v being decrescent and this is v dot being negative definite yeah so, so this implies negative definiteness of V dot. This implies positive definiteness of V. This implies decrescence of V. Yeah. The only additional things here are that these are all same orders of magnitude. Okay. So this is what was critical for exponential stability. Okay. So this is the result we have already seen for exponential stability. We want to uh, give a sort of... Uh, what looks like a weaker result but it's not yeah so we want to give an alternate exponential stability theorem all right so what is this alternate exponential stability theorem it is essentially saying that if i have a system like a non-autonomous system x dot is ftx 
with some initial condition all right what i want is a candidate lyapunov function and some constants alpha 2 alpha 3 delta positive such that for all x in a local domain yeah uh, <coughs> we have these three equations to be satisfied right first is something like this alpha 1 norm x squared less than equal to vtx less than equal to alpha 2 norm x squared this is pretty much like the first statement that we saw except that i in this case i apologize except this in this case we are exactly writing the structure of this phi 1 and phi 2 right yeah but it's very much like the first statement not very different yeah because this gives me positive definiteness and this gives me decrescence right very similar the second statement is where things start to differ yeah v dot is negative semi definite only we don't require v dot to be negative definite this is not the case here here it's already requiring it to be negative definite but then we need an additional condition yeah this is 4.4 which says v dot is not negative definite but the integral of v dot on a sliding window again yeah now we have a sliding window of delta yeah the integral of v dot on a sliding window has to be negative definite okay so so this is a sort of you can think of it as a relaxed exponential stability theorem it says that v dot itself does not need to be negative definite but a moving window average of v dot needs to be negative definite and that's enough for exponential stability it should sort of uh, philosophically <clears throat> make sense anyway yeah because after all what are we saying we are looking at we are looking at analyzing a system over infinite time after all right we have infinite time therefore even if at a particular instant in time i don't get a dip in my state that is i don't get my state going towards the origin uh, but over a window of time i guarantee that it's going down right i mean yeah so instead of so one possibility is that i do this all the time right? but this is very unusual right i will almost never have a signal like this right so the other possibility is that i do something like this right so oh, i may be increasing but over a window of time i sort of dip okay and this is what is uh, sort of codified here in a more formal language that v dot itself is only semi definite but the integral over a moving window that is a moving window average is negative definite yeah very very nice very very interesting and very very powerful result yeah this is a very nice alternate exponential stability theorem right great so uh, yeah so the important thing to remember is that if i was just looking at equations 4.2 and 4.3 using a standard lyapunov theorems i would just have um, uniform stability and nothing more yeah, because this is just what we have right it will just give me uniform stability because i have v to be positive definite and decrescent and v dot to be negative semi definite right so i would just have obtained uniform stability out of these two uh, equations 4.2 and 4.3 right but of course because of 4.4 i get exponential stability right so yeah so we are not using babolat's lemma we are not using lasalle invariance yeah but we are able to show with a negative semi definite v dot only that uh, you have exponential stability yeah so remember we had several techniques for working with non strict lyapunov functions what is a non strict lyapunov function it's a candidate lyapunov function uh, which leads to a negative semi definite v dot but we know that the system is stable right like for example for the pendulum case um or for the simple harmonic oscillator case if you took half x1 squared plus x2 squared you know that the simple harmonic oscillator with damping is in fact a stable system right but we get v dot to be only negative semi definite right and so this was a non strict lyapunov function so for non strict lyapunov functions of this kind we had two techniques until now for proving asymptotic stability right one was the lasalle invariance which is the classical method of course 
The second was the Babalar's lemma, which is what we stress on significantly more in this course. And we will, we will continue to see users of this uh, Babalar's lemma right, in this course over and over again. Yeah. Um, but here we have a third way. Yeah. Theorem 4.1 here actually provides a third way of proving exponential stability uh, without invoking the Babalat's lemma or Lasalle invariance. All right. So of course we are not going to proof of this. Um, this is um, available in the book by Shastri. Um, and so, you know, you can always uh, refer to it if you are interested in uh, looking at a detailed proof of this result, of this very interesting result, I would say. Yeah. All right. So, um, another notion that we uh, sort of want to uh, use uh, is the notion of uniform complete observability. Remember, we showed the connection between persistence and stability for this uh, scalar case. Yeah. Now we were trying to generalize it to the vector case. Yeah, we are just trying to generalize it to the vector case. Now, the idea is or the question is how to do it, right? So we are moving uh, progressively in steps. So the first thing we saw was a sort of uh, exponential stability result, a new exponential stability result. And uh, the next thing that we are going to look at is the uh, notion of uniform complete observability, right? So what is uniform complete observability? So I hope all of you have already done linear systems course, a linear systems course, you are expected to have that background and you would have seen the notion of observability, right? Uh, you, you basically look at basic, uh, the observability matrix, which is, um, you know, uh, something like a C, uh, CA, C, CA. C A squared. Let's see, did I get this correct? This should be C, C A, C A squared, and so on. Yeah, this is the observability matrix. But we also had the observability gramian, right? We also had the uh, observability matrix. Is this? And we had the observability gramian, which allowed us to do. Um, give like a Lyapunov like equation or Riccati equation, which corresponded to observability. All right. So if you have not seen, I strongly encourage you to look at what is an observability Gramian. You will of course look at it here, but it was, it was used to be something like this, you know, it was, um, uh, phi transpose, uh, tau zero, um, let's see, phi transpose tau zero, C transpose C, V tau zero d tau. Okay, this is what was the observability Gramian, and the equivalent condition is that this is a max rank, or this is a uh, positive definite. Yeah, these were sort of the equivalent conditions for observability for linear time invariant systems. Okay. So of course, uh, the Gramian was also valid for time varying systems, right? So of course, it's a little bit more general notion, right? Um, so we look at the notion of a slightly stronger notion, if you may, and that is the notion of uniform complete observability. So what is that? So now we are sort of specializing to linear systems. So let's look at this uh, linear time varying input output system. So well, it's just an output system. There's no input because for the notions of observability, we don't really care about the input as such. So it's X dot is A of T X T and Y T is C T X T. All right. So this is the input output system. Sorry. This is the output system 5.1 where of course the states are in RN, the output is in RP and AC are piecewise continuous. So when do we say that this system is uniformly completely observable not just observable but uniformly completely observable is and if this is the acronym of course is uco 
if there exist positive constants beta 1 beta 2 and delta such that for all t greater than or equal to 0 this integral the gramian integral which is exactly this guy almost exactly this guy is lower and upper bounded by this beta 1 and beta 2 i yeah again the left hand side indicates positive definiteness and the right hand side just indicates boundedness okay here capital phi is of course the state transition matrix corresponding to at this is the state transition matrix which corresponds to a of t all right so again if you look at what is inside here that is the integrand this is of course a symmetric product so this is greater than or equal to zero at each instant in time right so what is the dimension so the state transition matrix is of course uh, r n by n c is what r uh, let's see it is uh, p by n right so the whole thing is in fact r what n by n right the whole thing is r n by n correct yeah but the thing is because c is uh, p is typically less than n therefore c is not full rank therefore this entire product is not necessarily full rank so it's only possibly positive semi-definite right but again just like the persistence of excitation so it's a lot of similarity with the persistence definition and in fact we will connect the two uh, just like the p definition you are expecting that the moving average be strictly positive definite so it's some kind of again a rotation condition right just like before so very uh, quickly we want to sort of see what's the difference with conventional observability the first thing is in conventional observability you take the range as some zero to capital t some initial time tf so this is what is your conventional observability gradient you just say that there is a finite time tf such that if you take zero to tf this is strictly positive definite okay here we don't have zero to tf we say that there is a sliding window of delta t of, of size delta such that it is positive definite and bounded on all these windows okay all right so this is uh, significantly different and also there's of course bounds on both ends and importantly very importantly just like persistence of excitation the bounds are in fact independent of the small t yeah, it's a uniform bound yeah these bounds cannot depend on the small t right so this is again something that's rather critical yeah so this is different from uh, conventional observability right um, therefore this uniform complete observability is in fact a stronger result right it's a much stronger result why because um, if we put t equal to say zero then obtain observability yeah then we obtain observability so why is it complete observability because it is valid for all t it's move for all t until infinity right and why is it uniform because these bounds are independent of t so this uniform complete observability is a notion which is stronger than observability itself and this is the notion that will help us prove stability of parameter identification systems all right excellent so let's sort of summarize what we did today we looked at uh, you know these alternate exponential stability uh, you know first of all we sort of tried to connect uh, or we made a connection between uh, stability of a scalar system and persistence of excitation yeah um, then in order to extend this notion to um, vector systems we are looking at uh, different tools the first was an alternate exponential stability theorem which seems to be um, you know very interesting alternative to babalats and lasalle invariants and then uh, we looked at the definition of uniform complete observability uh, which is again a notion which is stronger than conventional observability of linear time varying systems 
So for linear time varying systems, we are subsequently going to connect the UCO and then the exponential stability theorem and then persistence of excitation and all this nice mix is going to give us uh, the stability that we desire for vector systems with persistently exciting uh, gains in some sense. All right. Great. So this is where we stop today. I'll see you again next time. Thank you.